Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Ed Templer. And I'm Charlotte Wharton. It's been a terrible winter with snowstorms, endless rain and freezing temperatures. Depressing for most of us. But when your livelihood depends on good weather, it can be devastating. James Merson has more. Months of torrential rain have left fields submerged, saturated and sodden. Since November last year, Nearly 20 inches of rain has fallen in Oxford alone. Flooding fields, damaging winter crops and killing vital soil dwelling animals and insects. Farmers are counting the costs of the recent heavy rain, strong winds and flash floods that are swept across many parts of the country. So what is the impact this will have on Oxford's farmers? In the last month alone, dairy farmers have seen their income plunge by 42%, whilst livestock farmers' incomes have as much as halved. Over one-tenth of the land in England and Wales is at risk of flooding from rivers or the sea. Floods are becoming more and more frequent and increasingly severe. And as global warming brings heavier rainfall and wetter winters, the extent of the damage can only get worse. I spoke with local farmer Peter Wardway, who told me of the effect the rain had had on his crops. Well, we're standing in a field of oilseed rape that was sown last September uh, following winter wheat into the stubble. Um, the crop started off okay but then by the end of November the rain came down in earnest and at that point uh, washed quite a bit of it away and now it, it's beginning of March we have to decide whether this is worth carrying on with whether these little plants are going to recover or not and at the moment it's touch and go we, we may have to plough the whole thing up and start again which will be a hell of a loss. Last year's heavy rain has already led to a drop in the land that farmers can use and the National Farmers Union has predicted that alone will have already cost the farming industry £1.3 billion. And while some farmers can shoulder the burden of the occasional flood, many however are tied into contracts to supply retailers with produce that has already been destroyed and they are now having to source food from abroad in order to fulfil their obligations to the supermarkets. But who is taking responsibility for protecting farmers' private land? The Environment Agency say that farmers should be aware of the risk of flooding and plan ahead for the impact of climate change. But many farmers believe that budget cuts have seen river maintenance reach an all-time low and that the agency who were responsible for maintaining watercourses and dredging rivers have in fact been cutting costs and neglecting their duties. I think they could have done a lot more. I think they were very really slow to uh, react. Uh, to the floods. Last autumn, the government announced that £120 million would be put towards flood defences, but with dredging typically costing in the region of up to £20,000 per kilometre, it is easy to see why authorities are more committed to looking for cheaper options. The farmers, however, are running out of options. There is no insurance for ruined crops and no compensation. Leaving the question, is Britain's farming industry being hung out to dry? James Merson, Brooks TV News, Oxford. Yes, nature can cause serious damage. It can affect the economy, transport network and tourism. And with increasing evidence about climate change, do you try to be green where you can? It's something Oxford Brooks takes very seriously. Now, speed isn't something you normally associate with an electric car, but the Oxford Brooks racing team is helping to manage this. Melanie Thomas reports. The electric car, a planet saver for some and a waste of space for others. The power what we get from electric cars is less compared to the, the usual conventional road cars. They are very slow and I've heard that the batteries on them don't last very long and they're really expensive so they can spend as much money on a battery as they could on a normal car. It has many benefits such as its fuel efficiency and mileage costs, but it is something that has never been associated with speed. That is, until now. Today I'm here at the Oxford Brooks Automotive Lab where students have started work on an electric racing car to take part in the Formula Student Competition. I spoke with Gerald Pickford, team leader for Oxford Brooks Racing, to find out more. 
Formula Student is a five-day engineering competition that brings together students from all over the world to compete on level terms with whatever they've been able to design. The competition is designed to challenge them to produce a costing uh, business case and design presentation as well as putting them out on track as in a time attack event to see exactly whose car is the fastest. In, in the past couple of years the competition used to be uh, split into two groups. It was for alternative fuelled vehicles and petrol driven cars. Uh, last year was the first year at the UK that all cars have competed on a level playing field and an electric car lost the competition by only two and a half points out of the thousand available. I also spoke with Tom Driscoll, a Brooks PhD student who helps manage Brooks Formula student team. This is our electric car. Um, this is the second electric car that o Oxford Brooks has built. The first one competed at comp the competition in 2010, but unfortunately the low voltage battery system out of the high voltage and low voltage ran out of battery in the longest race, which also scores the most points, so it didn't do very well unfortunately. The next year we built this car, very similar, but slightly improved, uh, but we couldn't go to competition because of a few administrative issues due to a change in um, the personnel in the uh, engineering department, which is disappointing, but we, we took our car com to competition anyway and we uh, gained a lot of recognition for how good the car looked, even if we couldn't prove how fast the car went. Last August, the FIA announced Formula E, an electric-powered engine version of Formula One. This will help promote the electric car alongside worldwide city street races kicking off in 2014 in Rio de Janeiro. Oxford Brookes University is no stranger to the electric car and has worked with BMW on monthly trials back in 2009. This work went into BMW's i3 range, which will be launched next year. Many car companies already have hybrid models, and it's only a matter of time before the last combustion engine car powers down. For Brooks TV, I'm Melanie Thomas. Very green technology. And if you're wondering what to do when the phone on the battery phone you have runs out, you can now charge over the air. Who needs cables? It's a Foo reports. Wireless charging is a technology that uses an electromagnetic field to transfer energy between two objects. Now, this technology has been used widely in many aspects in the world. If you want to boost your phone, you don't need to spend a lot of time on finding your cable and plug your charger into the power socket. Instead, you can simply put your phone on your wireless charging device to make it charging. When you are driving the car, you can simply stop your car at a certain place and your car will gain energy from the wireless charging system. Although it brings a lot of convenience to the people, however, wireless charging has also been criticized of many problems, such as lower efficiency, slower charging speed, and many costs that you need to spend on using wireless charging devices. So, what does people think about that? The wireless chargers are good. They're good because you don't really need to carry the socket with your arm. I think wireless charging is a very good technology. Uh, in the smaller devices, it, it would be beneficial, but as far as the uh, way it is going for electric cars as such on on-the-go charging, I don't think in the near future that would be possible. But for smaller devices, yes. Despite there have so many problems in it, However, there are still a lot of companies using wireless charging technology in their products. We really hope people could get greater experience by using wireless charging products in the future. This is Izo Fu for Brooks TV. With spring coming soon, how about some cycling? Yes, students at Brooks cycle a lot, but how safe do they feel? Rupert Levin reports. Cycling has become more popular in recent years. With a lot of people choosing to cycle, safety has become an important issue. Cyclists have called for better safety measures after figures show deaths and injuries have more than doubled in the past decade. In fact, 58 people were killed or seriously injured in Oxford last year, compared to 27 in 2001. The City Council uh, likes cycling very much. Um, and they would like to do more for cycling. In fact, at the moment they have a project called Oxford Cycling City, which is um, investing tens of thousands of pounds in cycling projects, which is good news. Um, the difficulty for Oxford City is that the transport is controlled uh, by the county council. And the county council is um, uh, a conservative-led um, 
uh, organisation. I think in lots of places there are, there are things that make cyclists feel welcome. There are lots of cycle lanes. Um, uh, people in Oxford always find something to complain about. There are places where it's difficult to cycle. But compared with most small cities and certainly with big cities like Birmingham or Manchester, yeah, it's really friendly and really easy. We asked Oxford residents their opinions on cycling. I've never had any problems as long as we make sure that you sign out when you turn left or right. I think there's um, more cycle worm paths. Um, where they've gone it's not bad, but a lot of them are just painted on to existing roads, so they're not actually wide enough a road to be safe like that. Um, we could do with more bike racks, so you can see they're all full and there's never enough bike racks. Uh. And bus drivers um, are helpful, they give way, they let you cycle. Um, and because there are so many cyclists, um, it's a cycle-friendly city, I think. At the top of Little Clarendon Street, where the cycle lane has been rubbed out by paving, and people hurtle around the corner from St Giles, and there's a near accident every single day. I wrote to the council about it, and they said, actually, we've looked at this site, and we found that there have been no fatal accidents. So we, as far as we are concerned, it's completely safe. We spoke with James Merson, a Brooks postgraduate student who cycles every day from Marston to Wheatley campus, an eight mile journey fraught with dangers. Uh, the dangers I face on a day to day basis are potholes in the road and certainly drivers that overtake you and then come up against a traffic jam and cut you up at the last minute. Uh, it's lack of care and consideration from drivers really, uh, lack of awareness. Uh, cycling back at night along the A40 uh, from Wheatley to Headington is absolutely atrocious. Uh, the cycle track is barely visible at the best of times, but when you've got headlights coming, shining in your face, uh, then the visibility is literally zero. Cycling is fun. It keeps you fit and it's environmentally friendly. And it's one of the quickest transport modes used in urban areas. But do cyclists feel safe? Road safety is improving in Oxford for cyclists, but it seems as though there's a lot more to do to enhance cycle safety. This is Rupert Levin reporting for Brooks TV. After the break, we bring you the interview with Simon Hunt from Cyclox, the voice of Oxford cyclists. Stay tuned, we'll be back soon. Welcome back to Brooks TV. Yesterday, Simon Hunt from Cyclox spoke to Ed to discuss cycling in Oxford, a hobby for some and a sport for others. Simon, thank you for joining us. So what is Cyclox and how does this support cyclists? Okay, Cyclox is a pressure group, um, membership of about 200, um, operating mostly in Oxford City. Uh, doesn't have any power or authority, but we hope we've got a little bit of influence trying to persuade the politicians and the people who are responsible for transport in Oxfordshire to uh, improve facilities and, and uh, training for cyclists. Would you consider Oxford the capital of cycling? Uh, yes, I would like to think so, because I think Oxford is pretty much the capital of everything, really. Indeed. Uh, but I have to say, we've got some catching up to do, so yes. uh, there are better places. So w would you say that there are any <laughs> black spots within Oxford that were fairly bad in terms of accidents? Uh, the Botley Road railway bridge is the number one uh, bad spot that absolutely is, is that, the is highest that priority the highest? that needs to be, to be fixed. Okay, and uh, so in the last 10 years, cycling has improved by about 18%. However, the serious injuries and deaths have increased by over 100%. Does that concern you at all? Yes, of course it's concerning. Uh, even if it hadn't gone up at all, it would be concerning. Obviously. Every injury or, or death for any reason of anybody uh, that's to do with uh, transport, especially if it's avoidable, uh, is a concerning matter. So what are your views on the uh, 300,000 that was put on road safety this year in the budget? Okay, so I think you're referring to what the City Council is going to spend over four years starting this year, so 75,000 a year. Um, that's a really welcome boost because actually it's not the City Council's responsibility financially to pay for cycling, it should be the County Council. Um, so this will be a boost, it'll help uh, I think in terms of the signage of routes, that's important because it might take people away from the, the less favoured spots for cycling. Uh, it'll improve cycle racks and keeping them clear of dead bikes for instance. Um, uh, it won't be enough to do any serious infrastructure improvements in terms of uh, altering the, the layouts very much. 
Obviously, the safety behind most of these cyclists obviously relies on them making sure they have good practice. Is it good to encourage good practice in cycling? Of course it is, yes. <laughs> is that part of what uh, Cyclox does as well? Yes. Uh, well, uh, we can point to how we would like to see the uh, education of cyclists improved. With just 200 members, we're not going to be able to do much ourselves directly, although we do have one or two members who are very actively involved in schools like the Charwell School, for instance. Charwell School is fantastic, has a really high cycling population and they're well advised, they've got parents on board. So these, are, these are good ways of promoting ways the cycling. cycling Absolutely. Yeah. Is there much support from the local authorities in terms of cycling? Uh, the County Council has a little bit of support. It doesn't have a ring fence budget just for cycling, which we think is a shame. It doesn't have a cycling officer, which we think is a shame. So there's no internal person who's kind of batting for cycling in, in the County Council. Uh, uh, but they'll listen to us and when they've got a scheme on, like Fridwide Square, for instance, at the moment, or like the uh, proposed improvement along the London Road out to the Green Road Roundabout, then, uh, of course, they'll consult with us. Wonderful, Simon. Well, thank you very much for joining us on this. Pleasure. Cycling is not the only thing that some people are up in arms about. Private renting in Oxford can be a minefield, especially for students. You might remember we investigated the issue recently. Well, now we've been taking a look into what's being done to solve the crisis. Lorcan McMullen reports. The City of Dream Inspires has long been home to a large transient student population, with many professionals also living and working here. It means rental property is always in demand, especially housing for student and professional sharers. Back in 2012, Brooks TV reported on the introduction of extended licensing for Houses of Multiple Occupation, or HMOs, in Oxford. This is housing for three or more tenants who form more than one household. At that time, landlords voiced their concerns at the cost implications of the new licensing. That we will have to put fire doors on each of the habitable rooms, as well as that we'll have to put automatic door closers, uh, like the ones in hotels, on, on each of those, and that'll probably cost around £150 a room. I spoke with Tony Brett of the Oxford City Council to better understand their reasons for the licensing and how it has had an impact since being introduced. The purpose of the HMO licensing is to give the council a bit more of a handle on the huge private rented market in Oxford, particularly those houses where they're shared by people who are not necessarily related to each other. Those tend to be the houses where sometimes there are problems where landlords um, think they can get away with more so people end up living in very substandard conditions and because they're not one unit um, it's much harder for them to actually approach the landlord or the letting agent and get things done. So the principal reason for licensing is to improve the lives of tenants and uh, I think it's, it's very much doing that. And since the scheme started in 2011 there have been uh, I think about 338 cases investigated and uh, 82 are being investigated currently so, uh, so there's an awful lot of work going on. The latest rogue landlord to be successfully prosecuted is Mohammed Abbas of Barnes Road, Cowley. He is the 34th landlord to be convicted under the new laws at Oxford Magistrates Court. The HMO he let didn't have a licence, was structurally unsafe and was in poor decorative condition. In his defence, he claimed he was unaware of HMO licensing. In a city where the average monthly rent costs almost half the average monthly gross wage, is it not only right that tenants be informed and protected? Agree with the licensing or not, the message from Oxford City Council to landlords seems clear. If you're letting an unlicensed HMO, then your time is running out. Lorca McMullen, Brooks TV News. Challenging indeed. Next, does the online streaming of films mean the death of cinema? Websites like Netflix, Love Film and Skygo are more popular than ever. Anu Rood reports. Once a booming business, but now going out of business. This is what has happened to entertainment giants HMV and Blockbuster, some of the biggest names in the UK high street, both of them collapsing under intense competition from internet-based entertainment services. The internet has become a popular source of entertainment, and online entertainment services like Netflix and Love Film have gained a considerable advantage as the tech-savvy population of Oxford seem to prefer these new media over conventional ones like television. I only watch them on TV, but now 
I don't have access to a television and I've found that my laptop will do just fine without me needing to buy one. Most of the TV I watch is online and it will be things through iPlayer and 4ID and things like this. So I'll watch the same TV shows, normally it'll be a week of them coming out, but not actually when they're broadcast live on the television. And I'm quite happy with that. You're going to have to wait for you know, certain timings. Yeah. If you want to watch this movie, yes, you have to wait until 7pm or something. And Netflix you can just watch whenever you feel like watching. I usually just stream them online and the main reason for that is that you don't have to worry about uh, TV advertisements. So you don't have any kind of advertisements uh, when you're watching them online. They have been competing aggressively for their share of the entertainment market with Netflix achieving 1 million subscribers within a year and Love Film having 2 million subscribers across the UK. Online entertainment services may have done well for the small screen but when it comes to the big screen this is not the case. If it's a, a big budget movie which is all about graphics like Avatar or something I would much rather watch it in 3D mm. in a movie hall. Big sound. Yeah. It's something else than TV or streaming. When there are new films out, I would like to see them in the cinema. But the problem is that's a lot more expensive than services like Netflix and Love Film. So with those, I can pay £5 a month and then I get a broad selection of films, even though they may not be the most recent ones. To the users, it all comes down to a matter of variety and choice that online entertainment services provide, but television doesn't. But when it comes to cinema, it's more of an open debate like more social okay you can have a restaurant after or something else you can actually do the same thing with friends at home yeah you can have a couple of people over mm -hmm. and have a few drinks and watch the movie but would the rapidly growing online entertainment industry be able to compete with cinemas in the future that would be something for the next generation of the audience to decide this is anirudh reporting for brooks tv now, a mystery sport to us, British handball. How much do you know about this classic sport? It's a Foo reports. Handball is relatively unfamiliar in Britain, but it has made great strides in catching up with its European neighbours during the past few years. Prior to this year, a British handball team had never been to the Olympic Games. But this year, since they organized the Olympic Games, they had to compose a team for each gender. It was quite tough for them to challenge the other very good teams, such as the French, German and Croatia teams. I think handball has a great future and great potential in the United Kingdom. It, in a way, combines the speed of tennis, the tactics of football and the roughness of rugby. A Sport England survey last year showed almost a six-fold increase in participation. So here we are at the University of Oxford Sports Centre, where many students choose here to play the sports, such as handball. Most people haven't played handball in their lives, so the first time they hear about this is usually in university. And for example, this year it was in the Olympics, so we have a lot of freshers coming in, but uh, they have never played handball before, and they play against people like me from the continent so we've been playing for ages so it's really hard for them to get into it um, you know it's if it, it, you're playing against somebody who's been playing for 10 years it's not quite that easy Oxford Brooks University provide 37 different clubs and teams but no handball Brooks don't have a handball team and we are actually nine girls from Brooks playing at the Oxford Blues. I came to play to Oxford because there's no other place where to play in like a hundred miles around. When I came here in September I was really happy to find this team in Oxford and I was really happy to have the ability to, yeah, to play handball. The team is composed of 90% non-English players. Out of the eight British players, only one is registered to play in the English Handball League. If you want to find out more about handball in Oxford, please go to groupspace.com slash OU handball It's a fool, Brooks TV Have you ever played handball, Ed? I vaguely remember being hit in the face by one while playing it when I was younger but never since then Well that's it for this week and remember you can view all of our previous episodes online by going to btv.brooks.ac.uk and if you want to tell us what's happening near you, please email your stories or questions to brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye. Goodbye.